I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I was in Maribel's office waiting for him, and uh, he didn't show up. Uh, so finally I had to call somebody to take me back home. We were supposed to have a uh, discussion, a, what do you call that, uh, verbal history? Or, uh, we were supposed to discuss my life, you know. He wanted to make some kind of... Uh, uh, official verbal history of that. And then when I got home, I discovered that he had died, you know, the next day. Uh, the idea of, 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 of Marable's book, because I wanted to say that, because he was a friend of mine, certainly. And I agreed with, say, the book he did on Du Bois and uh, some of his other writings. Uh, but the book on Malcolm struck me as peculiar, I'd say, because the whole question about the reinvention of himself. It, f first of all, it seems like that uh, dismisses our actual meetings with Malcolm, his actual effect on us in the real world, you know. So why would he have to reinvent himself? What would that mean to, to try to uh, delve into some kind of reinvention? It's the first question. And, and certainly, um, to use the FBI and New York, New, New York Police Department files uh, would not contribute much to our understanding. Malcolm, it would contribute us to understanding the New York Police and the FBI. As a matter of fact, I got 3,000 pages of FBI, you know, files on myself. I could only afford 3,000 pages. They charged me $300 for the 3,000 pages. At first, the director of the FBI said he didn't have any pages on me. Uh, but then a friend of mine, Allen Ginsberg, had a lawyer looking for his papers. So he got this lawyer to look for my papers, and lo and behold, Eureka. It was 3,000 pages. I was reading those pages, and my wife said to me, my wife Amina said to me, uh, well, why do you think they would show you the stuff that really happened? Why would they let you look at those pages? I mean, do you really believe they would show you the facts that they were dealing with? Which is a good question. The rest of the stuff is blacked out. The stuff that's not blacked out, the FBI is saying, read this. So you'd think that after all the skullduggery that they had gone through, that they would actually uh, show you what they were really doing. Also, I should think that the, the idea of post-racial, this is supposed to be post-racial uh, America. Now, you know that's a lie. I know whatever. You know, I mean, I support Obama. Well, I support Obama because I've seen the Republicans uh, <laughs> more than anything. And, uh, you know, with that group of comedians, you couldn't do anything else but support Obama. But post-racial, but Afro-American people still have no equal rights. They still have no self-determination. So post-racial don't cut that, you see. We're still struggling pretty much in the same mode. You know, I would say this, uh, 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 Obama's politics are a little more progressive than the Republicans by two or three inches. But there's still no equal rights or self-determination. So the question is this. What is it that you think Malcolm, what is the reason you think that making Malcolm uh, more human, that's what they say. The same thing they did with Martin Luther King on Broadway with that mountain side, was mountaintop. Why is it that you're going to make them more human? Is it more human means we have less reason to follow them, to have followed them, you see? Uh, and I think that what Marable does, basically, and I could read this essay, but I, I, you know, I don't want to do that. I think that what, 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 what Marable is guilty of, having, belonging to the Democratic Socialists, which is not a Marxist organization, which are not Marxist-Leninists, who are actually the people that Lenin describes in his struggle with social democracy, 
you see, who is opposed to revolution, you see what I mean? Malcolm X was revolutionary, first of all, you know, no matter what you might think of that. He was a revolutionary. So it seems to me a lot of the talk uh, of Maribel was to downgrade the nation of Islam. You might like, not like the nation of Islam. You might like, not like Muslims. You understand? But the fact is this, that the nation of Islam had more influence on the Afro-American people than the DSA ever had. That the, that the nation of Islam had more influence on, on black people than the Communist Party. And that the black liberation movement had more influence on the Afro-American people than any social democratic organization. And I don't think they can bring themselves to accept that fact. That these people selling them bean pies and them newspapers, you might not understand that, but they had more influence on black people than the Communist Party ever had. Now, that's important that you understand that. Uh, So the downgrading of the Nation of Islam, the downgrading of the black liberation movement, which, you know, people say, well, they're not. The black liberation movement was not a Marxist-Leninist movement. Do you know Lenin, what Lenin said about that? And I'm going to quote this, you know, because the revolutionary, and he said this in the foundations of Leninism, the revolutionary character of a national movement under the conditions of imperialist oppression does not necessarily presuppose the existence of proletarian elements in the movement. The existence of a revolutionary or a republican program of the movement, the existence of a democratic basis for the movement, the struggle that the emir of Afghanistan is waging for the independence of Afghanistan is objectively a revolutionary struggle, despite the monarchist view of the emir and his associates, for it weakens, disintegrates, and undermines imperialism. Whereas the struggle waged by such desperate Democrats and socialists, revolutionaries and republicans was a reactionary struggle. Lenin was right in saying that the national movement of the oppressed countries should be appraised not from the point of view of formal democracy, but from the point of view of the actual results as shown by the general balance sheet of struggle against imperialism. Now that's important to understand that the black liberation movement, the nation of Islam, etc., never presumed to be Marxist-Leninists but presumed to be fighting against imperialism, and they'd done that. Uh, I just had this same struggle with uh, our friend Dyson uh, on Democracy Now. Uh, So I wanted to know why this intense desire to turn us away from what we actually observed as their leadership quality. Now, in terms of Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X, I would say this, the reason that the movement, uh, that there was a split in the movement, if you remember the Montgomery bus boycott, you know what, they, what did they, boycotted the buses, you know, that's 1955, first uh, uh, Emmett Till murdered, Dr. King comes to Montgomery, the whole Montgomery bus boycott takes place. At the end of that boycott, when they had finally won, they blew up Dr. King's house. In Montgomery, the black people show up with rifles saying, Dr. King, Dr. King, what should we do? He says, if any blood be shed, let it be ours. My generation is so not going to be like that now. (laughs) If any blood be shed, let it be ours. No, it ain't going to be like that. You know what I mean? We love you, Dr. King, but if people come here talking to prove their whiteness by killing us, we're going to try to kill them back. I mean, that's just, and so Malcolm appears at that time, and Malcolm says what? You treat people like they treat you. He says, if they treat you with respect, you treat them with respect. But if they put their hands on you, send them to the cemetery. That was the basic kind of division. Yet when I met with Malcolm a month before he was murdered at the Hotel Teresa with Mohammed Babu, who had just come back from making a revolution in Zanzibar, which uh, ended up being the Republic with Tanganyika, the Republic of Tanzania. Malcolm talked about the united front, the need for a united front, you see. Uh, It's interesting because I met Martin Luther King the week before he was assassinated. He came to my house. And, you know, I saw these people coming up the street, helicopters and stuff. I thought we were getting busted. And it was Dr. King knocked on the door and said, hello, Leroy. (laughs) You don't look like such a bad person. 
People told me you were a bad person. <laughs> but Dr. King said the same thing, that we need a united front, that no single ideology can make the changes that we need in this society. And that's obviously true. That's what Stokely Carmichael said all those years. Every time we talked, he talked about the need for a united front. We still have not learned that. We still think that if we are Muslims or Christians or Marxists or vegetarians, that somehow that will be the key to overthrowing uh, monopoly capitalism. But I say this, just like uh, Obama won that because, first of all, 90% of the black people said, no, you're going to be the president. 60% of the Latinos, 60% of the Asians, and a good part of the progressive white people, and all those are minorities. <laughs> They finally said, you're going to win this. And I think that that kind of united front that actually elected Obama, whatever you think about him now, you must do that again in the face of the Republican, the right wing, you know. Uh, but the idea, uh, the fundamental idea here in this book here is that we're saying that there's a, 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 a disconnection. Is Maribel's failure to understand the revolutionary aspects of black nationalism as a struggle for self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense. A struggle for equal democratic rights expressed on the sidewalks of an oppressed nation, of an oppressor nation by an oppressed Afro-American nation. That's the most important thing. Uh, so there is much more from Marable framing Malcolm's murder, for instance, as the nation of Islam rather than the state. You know what I mean? Uh, to set that up. Uh, Malcolm, uh, Marable's general portrait of Malcolm as a doomed and confused individual about whom he could say that Malcolm, quote, Malcolm exclusively read, extensively read history, but he was not a historian. Now that is an incredibly elitist statement. He read history, but he wasn't a historian. That is, that's out to lunch to me, to me, you know. Uh, as if the academic title historian conferred a, scien a more scientific understanding of history than any grassroots scholar might have. That's simple class bias, you know. Uh, and to say that the Nation of Islam was not a radical organization obscures the black nationalist confrontation with the right racist oppressor nation. Marable thinks that the Trots or the Socialist Workers Party or the Communist Party or the Committees for Correspondence are more radical. But that means he has not even understood Lenin's directive, as I just read that to you. Uh, Marable spends most of his time trying to make the uh, Nation of Islam Malcolm's murderers. Information from the FBI, boss, CIA, you know, a New York police department, you know. Uh, Malcolm said one time when he came through France and French wouldn't let him in, he said his mistake was he made too much, he was spending too much time worrying about the nation of Islam and not enough time working about the United States government. And that's very important. Uh, But even as he, Marable, keeps hammering away that it was the nation of Islam, he still says contradictorily, the fatwa or death warrant may or may not have been signed by Elijah Muhammad. There's no way of knowing. Well, many of his claims fall under that same category. There's no way of knowing. Uh, Marable also tells us that even today, the FBI refuses to release its reports on Malcolm's assassination, even today. Yet he will quote one of those agencies without question. Of Betty Shabazz's death, Marable says flatly, of Malcolm's daughter, Kabila, her disturbed 12-year-old son set fire one night to his grandmother's apartment. How does he know this? Do you mean you just simply trust what the FBI says? Why should we? I don't understand the... the, 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 the uh, logic there. Marable says that in effect that Malcolm misunderstood Martin Luther King's influence on black people. He didn't misunderstand that influence. He was trying to provide an alternative to it. He understood it only too well. You know, a whole generation understood that, you know, that we were not trying to, that we didn't misunderstand King. We didn't uh, believe that. Interestingly, on the back of the book, are three academics who represent the same democrat, social democratic thought as Professor Marable. Skip Gates, who disparages Africa 
he looks for racism in Cuba, but not in Cambridge, and says that the Harvard Yard is his nation. My friend Cornell West, who in response to me calling out at the left forum, I said, where are the communists? Where are the socialists in here? He said, I'm a Christian. And I tried to point out what happened to Christ, you know, who, who was supposed to be a Christian. And then Michael Eric Dyson, who wrote a book on Dr. King, calling it the true Dr. King, someone like Marable's approach to Malcolm. But who and what else in this paper garden of even are this post-racial America? So they are telling us that it's necessary that we view ourselves as real leaders in our struggle in favor of academics who want to tell us we were following flawed leaders with flawed ideas, although none of these Negroes would have those jobs if it wasn't for them flawed leaders with them flawed ideas. <laughs> telling us we should not follow our real leaders, but we should follow these academics who want to tell us we were following flawed leaders with flawed ideas. We don't need equal rights and self-determination. An appointment to an Ivy League school would do just fine. So uh, <laughs> that is, I guess, basically what I have to say about this book. I mean, uh, the only thing I add is that now, by now, we should all be seeing the, that the 911 gambit was really the doorway into the Middle East, that since they went through that door, they've been in Afghanistan, Iraq, you understand, they overthrew Libya, now they're trying to do the same thing to uh, Syria with their eyes on Iran. But I'll tell them one thing they need to remember. Iran is not Arabs. Those are the Persians. Now you go back to your own history and check out the Persians, they'll tell you something you need to know. <laughs> Amiri, why don't you just say what you really feel, huh? <laughs> One of the um, most interesting of the contributors in the book is uh, my good friend, Bill Fletcher, Jr. Bill and I were members of the BRC, the Black Radical Congress. Um, I think I may have a little bit more of a unique distinction and also being a member of the Nation of Islam. I don't know if Bill was there or not. I don't know how many people can make that claim of being with the BRC and with the Nation of Islam. You have to live a few years, I think, to make that kind of connection, huh? <laughs> but uh, one of the most, uh, I think, interesting thing about his uh, essay in the book is his analysis of the BRC. And some of the, uh, I see a lot of my uh, colleagues who were in the organization I would certainly direct them to his assessment, his analysis of what happened with the BRC. I think it's one of the most telling uh, analysis that we can get on that organization. So it's almost like, a, I don't know, un unintended consequences that grows out of, a, of, a, of an essay on Manning Marable's book that we get that rich information about the BRC. But uh, Bill, I met him first when, I mean, as a union activist, a labor activist out there, we worked together on a book called Race and Resistance uh, that was put out uh, by the, um, by a bunch of lefties, huh, Bill? You know, they put the book out there, and we did a good job there of talking about the history of the labor movement. Also with uh, TransAfrica, where he was a president, former president there with the Institute of Policy Studies, where I think he continues to be as a senior member, as well as uh, on the board at Black Commentator. And um, hey, let me bring you Bill Fletcher, Jr., okay? <laughs> Thank you, Herb. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank Herb, and I also want to thank Haki uh, for having uh, invited me to uh, contribute to the book that was mentioned, uh, the collection of essays, on, uh, in response to Manny Marable's book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. I also want to say that um, as a younger baby boomer, 
it's both difficult and exciting to be on this panel because I can say it's good to be on a panel with my elders. Um, okay. No, it's good. It's real. Um, before I get into my, my words, I, I don't want to say this has been, this is one of the most difficult exchanges over the last year. Um, for me, uh, someone that at the age of 13 read the autobiography of Malcolm X one, uh, one fall and uh, found that that book changed my life uh, and to encounter people around the world who had a similar experience, um, it's this discussion has been painful, uh, and it's been complicated. But I want to start there because I want to say that this discussion should not be about people's love or respect for Malcolm X. See, once we've established that Malcolm X was not the Messiah, nor was he the Mahdi in either the Sunni or Shia traditions, it should at least theoretically be possible to engage in a discussion about Malcolm and his legacy. The one obstacle to such a discussion, however, was summed up by one activist when they proclaimed shortly after the publication of Marable's book that the people need icons. When I read this, I realized that what it actually meant was that some people believe that it is neither possible nor appropriate to undertake a materialist examination of our beloved brother. And further, that anything that suggests that Malcolm was anything less than perfect somehow betrays our love and respect for our great and fallen leader. The controversy that surrounded the publication of Marable's book was extraordinary, less in my opinion due to the content of the controversy and more due to the tone. Leaving aside that Malcolm had just died, the anger, the homophobia, and indeed, hatred was venomous. It was noteworthy in that attacks on Marable's character and politics were undertaken not only by historic opponents of his, but also, at least in some cases, by individuals who Marable considered to have been his friends and comrades, individuals who, in some cases, Marable generously supported in various ways. I decided in speaking here today not to go tit for tat in this odd debate. I don't mean that this is odd but the larger debate, except to make a few points, after which I want to address some of what I believe to be the key issues raised in Marable's book that are worthy of further exploration. First, this will not be the last Malcolm X book. However, the standards set by Marable of over 10 years of in-depth research will be a challenge for any further writers. Second, it is clear, should we wish to be honest, that the attacks are largely about Marable. I've written some about this and will not belabor the point. The bottom line is that Malcolm X was commodified after his death, not only by the capitalists, particularly in the 1980s, but by, even by some on the left and the nationalist movements. These individuals, either through conferences, bookstores, or other items, came to believe that they and only they could lay claim to the legacy of Malcolm X. Marable, in that sense, was an interloper as far as they were concerned, not to mention an academic at a prestigious university. But a related point is that Marable dared to push the life and work of Malcolm X into the mainstream stage, but from the left. For some individuals, this was simply impermissible. Malcolm X was to be worshipped in private and at best within an all-black arena. Third, some of the criticisms are simply silly, if not examples of sophistry. Let me offer an example that struck me. One former colleague of Marable criticized the book for allegedly distorting Malcolm's life and legacy. The example that this person pointed to was Marable's reference to how Malcolm would have supported the Durban UN World Conference against racism. This writer indicated that Malcolm X would never have supported a dialogue with imperialists. I was struck by this criticism, so I went back to, to look at the book. If you read what Marable actually said, it will indicate that this critic was simply wrong in his interpretation and his facts, not to mention his intent. Marable was talking about the NGO forum 
that was connected with the UN World Conference Against Racism, where progressive forces from all around the world, including people that are sitting in this room, gathered. Yet I do not believe that this critic was so stupid as to not have known this, though I might be wrong. I think that this was simply a jab at Marable, an, attap- an atta- attempt to take him down a peg and to delegitimize the book. The attempt failed. Another example, often touted by some well-intentioned comrades, was a reference in the final chapter chapter, to Malcolm Malcolm X adopting an alleged race-neutral approach to his theory, with Pan-Africanism and Third World Solidarity he used as examples. Marable was jumped upon like white on rice for this reference. Now, the reference is peculiar. I read an earlier draft of the book, and that reference was not there. I concluded that one of two things happened. It was either a poor choice of words by Marable or the editor made the change. But let's assume that it was a poor choice of words. Is there anything in the work and writings of Marable to lead any person not suffering from Alzheimer's to believe that Marable could possibly have meant race neutral in the way that the term is used in the US today? Of course not. Marable was pointing to the challenge that Malcolm X, Malcolm X himself acknowledged of how to describe his evolving politics. There was some combination of revolutionary nationalists, pro-socialist, pan-Africanist, third worldist, with a bit of Islamism thrown in there for good measure. But Malcolm acknowledged after speaking with a North African light-skinned revolutionary that black nationalists as a term might not adequately describe his evolving views. Perhaps race neutral was an editor's interpretation of the expression non-racial, a term that is used in South Africa to describe anti-racist politics, but a term that we do not use here in the U.S. Given Marable's affinity with the South African movement, he may have used it. Having had my own issues with editors, I can believe that this might have been changed by a U.S. editor attempting to, unsuccessfully, make this clearer to a U.S. audience. In any case, there are other people who were much more intimately involved with the writing of this book such as Zahir Ali, who can go head-to-head with anyone on the particulars of the book. Let me suggest that the book stands as a marvelous contribution to the ongoing discussion of the life and work of Malcolm X. Perhaps when my generation is dead, a generation that venerated Malcolm, a generation that had Malcolm at the heart of our politics, perhaps only then will we be able to step back and truly examine Malcolm X's life and work without obscene and infantile efforts to impugn the character of this or that writer. Let me shift to a few of the critical points in the book that I believe to be worthy of serious discussion. The circumstances of the assassination, questions of organization, gender, and reform and revolution. The assassination is worthy of discussion alone, not only due to the information that Marable reveals about the possible assailants, but also about the circumstances that made the assassination possible. Marable proposes that three forces had an interest in Malcolm's demise, the Nation of Islam, the state, and some elements within his own organization. Malcolm found himself in a cul-de-sac by late 1964. He was moving at light speed compared with much of his organization. He was also driven by a fury at circumstances within the Nation of Islam that had led to his having been driven out. What was striking in reading the book was that you want to yell at Malcolm and beg him to pull up, to be more careful tactically. Yet he kept prodding the nation of Islam. The state clearly wanted his demise, so there's little to discuss there. But it was this question of people within his own organization that caught my attention, and it relates to several other factors. Malcolm had a set of loyal followers who were not necessarily with him politically. As Malcolm evolved, they did not necessarily, and precisely on the matter of gender, as women were starting to rise, they did not necessarily uh, adopt the same views as he. And this created an immense amount of tension with some of the older male followers. On top of this, Malcolm had two organizations that he was attempting to manage. It is, in fact, this matter of organization that jumps out at the reader. Malcolm needed to have a general secretary or executive director who was clearly empowered to lead the organization. Yet Malcolm appears to have been unclear about the division of labor between himself 
and some of his chief aides. This challenge reminded me of the building of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and a division of labor which succeeded between its president, A. Philip Randolph, and its chief organizer, Milton P. Webster. Detailed in the book, Keeping the Faith, what struck me is that while Randolph was clearly the political leader of the Brotherhood, the organization would have gone nowhere without the brilliance of Webster, who was the person who awoke, awoke every morning thinking about the challenges of organization. The relationship between these two individuals was critical. The matter of gender, as discussed by Marable, has been sensitive on several grounds, but is no less important. I'm not going to engage in a discussion about the possible same-sex relationship. When I read the draft of the book, that section was so unimportant that when the controversy arose with its publication, I thought it was from a different book. No, Malcolm was, for much of his life, not particularly at the vanguard of the struggle against male supremacy. He had a complicated view of his mother as well as of various women partners. He apparently had a caring relationship with Betty Shabazz, but done one that was not completely satisfying. He was willing to seek help in trying to work through the issues, but some of those issues appear to have revolved around unresolved matters concerning the woman who he had actually loved earlier and wanted to marry, but who ended up impregnated by Elijah Muhammad. But the story does not end there. During the final period of his life, his views seemed to change, and he actively engaged women in the construction of his ultimate political project, the Organization for African American Unity, or Afro American Unity. This takes us full circle to the circumstances surrounding his murder. His breaking with the crude misogynism of his Nation of Islam days was linked to an evolution in his own politics that started, and we must say started, to envision a liberated view of women. This journey was far from complete. Finally, the issue of reform and revolution. Some critics have suggested that Marable attempted to describe a Malcolm X that looked like Marable. I found this sort of humorous. Though Marable worshipped Malcolm X, a point that seems to have gotten lost in much of this discussion, he was enough in touch with his own ego and personality, not to mention his politics, to know that he and Malcolm were very different. Malcolm was grappling with the interaction of reform and revolutionary politics and practices, something that is worthy of great examination. The combination of global solidarity and anti-imperialism on the one hand, with his interests, those are, that is the interest of Malcolm in electoral politics, points towards something like what ultimately came to be known as the National Black Political Assembly. In other words, the National Black Political Assembly was, in my humble opinion, a logical con conclusion from a set of Malcolm's politics. While it is true that Marable was connected with the outgrowth of the assembly, specifically the National Black Independent Political Party, Marable was not describing his own evolution. Malcolm was trying to address what it meant to engage in pro-black progressive politics in a non-revolutionary situation. He seemed to be open to various coalitions, but his views were, frankly and with all due respect, undeveloped and too underdeveloped to draw any major conclusions. I, for one, am interested in exploring these issues. Whether Marable sufficiently applauded other writers on Malcolm is not my concern. I've been going over, for example, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States and noticed that he spent very little time commenting on other writers of U.S. history. Zinn was interested in presenting a narrative before the people to spark debate and answer many questions with which activists and regular people have been grappling. Manning had a similar objective. There is little doubt that despite the protests and hurt feelings on the part of some who believe that they and only they hold the Malcolm X franchise, Marable succeeded. Thank you very much. I guess the question, I guess the first question I'd like to raise is, how many of you have read Manny Marable's book? Show of hands. Okay, okay. We always say, uh, if you don't read it, you know, no investigation, you have no right to speak. So a few of you are probably ready to speak. Uh, I guess we have a microphone here to kind of get the Q&A started. Maybe I'll open it up with a question to the panel. First of all, if the panel may want to respond to what some of their 
fellow panelists have to say before we go forward, but also let me note that we're streaming live on Free Speech TV. I was just informed by the executive director, Don Rojas, my old comrade. And uh, so those of you who don't want to be seen, you know, be duly uh, warned and advised. Thank you. Amiri, go ahead. I know you've yeah. got uh, something to say. Well, you know, first of all... Pull question, the microphone to you, Amiri. Oh, I'm sorry. The question about Malcolm as a Messiah, I don't think, uh, unless you're talking about religious people, I don't think any of us, the Black Liberation Movement never held Malcolm as a Messiah. They simply thought his ideology was correct. Uh, and in terms of Malcolm's legacy, all those organizations like the Black Panthers, the Republic of New Africa, the Congress of African People, came from Malcolm's inspiration. You know, he was the most inspirational person of that generation. So, like, what actually it seems that you're saying is that the masses of us, the people who actually followed Malcolm because we thought that he was correct, that somehow that we were like either we thought it was a religious kind of thing. And in terms of the thing about Malcolm X commodified, by whom? Who, who did that? You mean the, the media? Certainly, their, their commodification must have been uh, negative. And, and, the, and the comment about we weren't worshipped in private, I mean, that's just gratuitous insulting. I mean, you know, the, the fact that we, we, we followed Malcolm meant that we worshipped him in private. Uh, I think what's, what's, what's necessary is uh, we get comments, and again, that's what I was criticizing Marable. Well, we get these criticized by people who never agreed with Malcolm ideologically, who never th thought his, what he was doing was correct. You understand? And so now they're going to go around the edges of him, trimming him off in some kind of way. And that's what I, that's what I mean. Uh, what we need to have is a debate on the ideology of revolution. If you want to do that, we need to bring it right straight out front, rather than, you know, nipping at Malcolm's heels, you know. Because the question is, what ideologically do you think Malcolm was doing wrong, you know? Uh, and also, the, the, the black nationalists might not uh, describe Malcolm as ex is evolution, that black nationalists, you know, I don't think it's a question of black nationalists might not, but I think people who were following Malcolm's thought, you know, and determined to see that thought proceed past his death, you know, it's not a question that we wouldn't be able to describe it. Uh, the thing about Betty Shabazz, again, that's like some kind of marable. That was what marable was kind of saying, stuff like that. It wasn't satisfied. How do you know that? Was you in there with him? I don't I mean, that's just out to lunch, you know. But I, I, uh, uh, I just don't see that as, as any, I mean, unless you got proof, take photographs. Or... In terms of the National Black Assembly, I didn't understand what you were saying about that. You know, because I was the Secretary General of that, I would like to know what you were saying about that, what that meant. Uh, in terms of Malcolm's views being undeveloped, what did, would they be as developed, <coughs> your view of it, see? Because I think that's what we need. We need a discussion of the ideological kind of uh, uh, conflict that's going on, not some kind of sideways criticism of Malcolm that's really criticizing a whole ideological development. You know, that's, that's what I think. We need to come out with it. You know what I mean? Because I know the Social Democrats never did dig Malcolm X. You understand? And so to, like, pretend they dug him, but blah, 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 that's just a lot of, well, you know what you call it. <laughs> So that's all I have yeah, to say I just, presently. Yeah, just. <laughs> well, <clears throat> okay, we, Haki, go ahead before Bill responds. Go ahead, Haki. I knew uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. And Malcolm loved this woman. They had six daughters. And the daughters who never really got to know their father through their mother. And Betty, Dr. Betty Shabazz, I cannot even visualize her not respecting that relationship. We used to, when she would come up to the uh, National Black Holistic Society, she came up uh, one weekend, we had it on our birthday. And so the brothers had decided that we're going to give her a present. And the present was um, 
a professional massage from Dr. Hapi, all right? She pulled me in that room and said, I'm not letting that man touch me. And again, it just spoke to the privateness of this woman and what she saw as important in terms of just maintaining and keeping the legacy of his memory alive in her life. She did go on to receive a doctorate degree. So she wasn't like some person in a jelly jar, not able to think and not able to you know, develop and not able to criticize if indeed there was problems within the context of the family. Because she did go on and the best she could, could do a marvelous job with those daughters until the tragedy happened in her life also. But what I saw as unnecessary is, number one, he don't know, he don't know what's going on, went on between the two of them. Well, what is the purpose of it? What is the purpose of it? I don't understand it. I mean, I mean my wife and I have been together since 1969. We have three children. And we have ups and downs, ups and downs. My wife's a PhD also. And so you go through problems, but you maintain, you keep this marriage going because you know it's important. And you love each other. And from what I can tell from my talking to Betty late at night, that she loved Malcolm and her daughters. Go ahead, Bill. But the point is, what did I, I, do I don't want to, I don't, I'm sorry, excuse me, Mary. I don't want to sound like Robert De Niro, but are you talking about me? Talking to me? I mean, it's like this, this thing about criticisms around the side of Malcolm. I mean, you talking to me? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm talking about the statement you just made up there. Right. right. And, and what I was talking about was about, the nat- about whether or not fundamentally we can have a discussion about Malcolm. Right? Whether or not we can look at Malcolm and look at the strengths and weaknesses of Malcolm. This is not about whether I loved Malcolm or didn't. It's not about whether I was, I mean, my, my, just like you and others, Malcolm inspired me and has been central to who I am. But there is this reluctance to have a discussion, and it goes to this question you're raising, Haki, no, the purpose. No. The purpose is to understand the man, understand his motivations, understand the challenges that he was facing, to understand issues of strategy. I mean, that's what biographies, that's what good biographies are about. It's, it's to look at the context, look at the situations and challenges someone is facing, and ask yourself, what do you think about that, and then what are the ramifications today? This whole thing about social democracy, Amir, you've got to give it up, man. I mean, it's just like, I don't, I, I don't know I why, I don't know why you keep raising this about because Maribel. Because it's true. Because they Maribel always left, end up on the wrong side. Amiri, Amiri, uh, Maribel left DSA a long time ago. He never left his mind, though. See, to that's raise the this. As an issue, just to, to delegitimize any formal discussion. No, it's the question of the ideological. You can see the conflicts ideologically. It don't have to do with no personal stuff. It has to do with what they think revolution is and how it has to be approached. What no. you think Malcolm X was and what he was doing. Right. You understand? And it's still the same thing. What you're doing is criticizing ideologically without bringing that out to the front. Bring out the ideological conflicts. Those are where we really get down. That's what we really want to talk about. I'm criticizing people who have decided that they, rather than have a real discussion about some of these critical issues in the book, would rather focus on Marable's intent, cons- almost conspiracy theories, that, that this book, I mean, this whole idea that was raised by some people, why did this book come out now? Well, let's see. Oh, this guy's been working that. on this book for about 15 years. You know what? I know what happened. Yeah. 15 years ago, he conspired with the bourgeoisie to figure out that just at this moment, Well, who would raise that except a fool? No, nobody would ever raise something like that. That's a foolish Brother, idea. You should you know. reread this book, and then you'll see uh, maybe Which some, book? this book. And then you will see some of these allegations that are in there. Yeah. I mean, let's but what be I'm real, saying Mary? is this. To say that you, don't want, that you are facing people who think 
Malcolm is a Messiah, that's like a false kind of idea. It's not that's false to, at all that's to make us metaphysicians the in the beginning. When if you want to talk about ideology, bring it down. What ideologically are we talking about? Don't tell us we think Malcolm is a Messiah. You know, that's, that's, that's just corny. When people say yeah. that the people need icons, that is in fact exactly what they're saying. They're saying that there are individuals that should be above criticism. I don't happen to come from that school of thought. I happen to think that human beings... Who said that? Individuals should be above criticism. I I don't come from that side of thought either. No. I don't don't believe that at all. I don't believe it at all. I think that it's important for... And this is why we include you in the book. (laughs) I thought it was because of my naturally curly hair. (laughs) I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.